up, you guys? My name is Grace Lauren Taylor, and you are listening to episode 11 of the Trauma Dump Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Here at the Trauma Dump Podcast, we seek to answer the question, what is mental health, how do I take care of my own, and how do I support others? This week, we will be discussing the topic of service dogs. What is the difference between a service dog and an ESA, otherwise known as an emotional support animal? We're gonna find out today. And we have a lovely special guest, my service dog, Gigi. I'm sorry if she's not perfectly in frame. It was some work <laughs> to get her into this director's chair. But hey, she's here with us. She might want to give her input. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe she's just gonna chill and eat her greenies. But yeah, there she is. So I really wanted Gigi to be sitting up here with me but unfortunately she's a little bit uncomfortable. So we're not gonna do this setup anymore. Now that we've moved to a more comfortable spot for Gigi, by the way, this is where all of my in-person guests sit, especially those that are anonymous and in-person. They get to sit on this comfy bed and get to chill out with Gigi every single time they come on. So our last episode that we had an in-person guest was Magnolia. I think on episode seven, I believe, which was religious abuse. So this week we are discussing the difference between uh, ESA, which is an emotional support animal, and a service dog or a service animal. Something that has happened recently, I think within the last five years, is that the ADA only recognizes dogs as service animals now. Um, I don't think miniature horses are really recognized as service animals, or at least their, um, let's say their allowance is limited now. Um, there used to be service animal miniature horses that went on planes, and I think that's no longer a thing according to my research and at least on the ADA website. So just a quick disclaimer before we start, I am not a licensed health professional. I'm just a person who has trauma. This podcast only seeks to create community and further understanding of these difficult topics that are so often misunderstood. If you or a loved one are in need of medical professional help, we have resources in the description. The de if you or a loved one are in need of medical professional help, the resources are in the description. The topics discussed here are for a mature audience, so viewer discretion is always advised. So service animals are dogs that have been individually trained to perform a specific task for individuals who have disabilities. Disabilities can vary greatly, and so do the tasks that the service dogs perform. Service dogs can aid in navigation for people who are hearing or visually impaired. They can assist an individual who is having a seizure, calm an individual who suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, and even dial 911 in the event of an emergency. Many disabled individuals depend on their service animals every day to help them live their normal everyday lives. So Gigi, is a PTSD support dog and medical alert service dog. She has been pretty crucial in helping me function semi-normally. So when Gigi doesn't have her vest on, she is kind of off duty. Whenever she's in private with just me, I mean, she's never really off duty, but she gets to become a normal dog. She gets to do her normal dog things. She gets to play with toys. Like this one, this is her lobster, who she loves very, very much, as you can tell. And she gets to play with our cats. But when she is on duty or in public, she has her vest on. She doesn't really interact with people. She doesn't really interact with animals. The only person she interacts with is me or my partner, Joey, or a close, close friend and she always asks if it's okay with me by looking at me and I'm like, oh, it's okay, you can meet them, uh, which is the command, you can meet them, and she'll go and sniff that person. So she's, 
You're pretty cool, Gigi. Did you know that? Did you know you're pretty cool? Yeah? <laughs> yes, she did. So I got Gigi when I was 16 years old. And she is going to be seven on October 10th. So your birthday is coming up pretty quickly, mamas. You're gonna be seven. So on her birthday, I will have a little birthday party for her and make her a little cake and I'll post some videos on my own personal channel. So if you wanna see that video whenever it comes out, be sure to click the link in the description to follow my personal channel where you can see more of Gigi and our cats, Loki and Lucy. So I have had severe anxiety and depression. I was officially diagnosed when I was 15 years old. And from the moment when I got baby Gigi, which here's a picture of me and baby Gigi, from the moment when I first got Gigi, I felt extremely safe. She has helped me thrive. She has graduated college with me. She has helped me continue living. And she was officially trained as a service dog in 2020 after my father was um, hit by a car. I started training her to be a PTSD support dog and then I started developing seizures. So then that's when I transitioned from training her from being just a PTSD support dog because I have an official PTSD diagnosis and I got diagnosed with non-epileptic seizures. And so then I was like, I, I need help. And my doctor told me, you know, you can train your dog to be a seizure alert dog. And so that's what I did. And so Gigi got officially certified in February of 2021. It's important to note that the Americans with Disabilities Act states that a service dog does not need to be professionally trained. The service dog can be trained by the individual whom it serves, right? But it is strongly recommended by me that you do get at least some formal or professional training for a service dog, especially if it is a guide dog for the blind or a, a uh, mobility assistance dog. Those I really do believe need, need to be professionally trained because they learn so many different things. I mean, I started training Gigi on my own for PTSD, right? And once I started signing up for these classes, I learned so much, she learned so much, and we both grew together. And so I would strongly recommend if you need a service dog to first formally train that dog. I know that Petco does some basic training for your dog, get basic training, and then move from there into more specialized training. That would be my recommendation. So Gigi has over 2000 hours of public training. What that means is she has 2000 logged hours of us being in public in public places like on a plane, like in an airport, at a bus station. She has been to all of the major retails like Target and Walmart and the mall. So she has 2000 hours of in public training of her going through different exercises so that she is not easily distractible. I want to say this and it does make me really frustrated but people will try to distract Gigi on purpose. And I've noticed that it's mostly young men, maybe like in their late teens, early twenties, mostly frat boys that will whistle at her, that will bark at her, bark at me, um, and try to get her attention. She does wonderfully. She does her absolute best to ignore them. But again, she is a dog right? I am a human. Even I turn around sometimes when they whistle, right? So Gigi and I both get catcalled 
quite frequently in public and she does her absolute best and she is so well trained to ignore them. Uh, we had an incident earlier, I think this past week, where a woman was following Gigi and I down the aisles of Target. And at first I was trying to ignore her, right? I, I thought maybe she's trying to read Gigi's vest. Maybe she wants to see what Gigi's vest says. And she followed us down like five different aisles. And then she came right up to Gigi and started petting her like this. Now, mind you, Gigi, when she wears her vest, it's pretty thick. So she's rubbing Gigi's vest, rubbing Gigi's head, trying to get Gigi to look at her, like grabbing her face. And I say, excuse me, ma'am, can you please not touch my dog? She's a service dog. And she straight up laughs at me like mockingly laughs at me and it makes me cry at that time i did start to tear up and i ran away with Gigi as fast as i could it was it's very distressing because i have seizures so any moment where Gigi's not focused on me i could have had a seizure in public and that could have been really really catastrophic and what irks me even more is i asked her to stop she could clearly read that she's a service dog and the lady also said, aw, your mommy must not love you. I don't know if she was saying it to me or most likely to Gigi about me, but that also really made me mad. Gigi has a vest that says, do not pet on it, service dog. And um, some people just ignore it and I, get really triggered by that. <sighs> In my own personal opinion, Gigi will never stop being trained. She will never stop learning, even as she's getting older. The saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks is super false because Gigi became trained as a service dog in 2020 when you were about like four, yeah. And she's so, so good. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm so blessed to have her as my companion, as my helper. And you know, you, you can train any dog to become a service dog. Any dog can become a service dog, but it all it just all depends upon their temperament. Service dogs have to be extremely calm and they have to be very good in public and very good with ignoring outside stimuli. And I will say that if your dog is not you know, fully trained and basic training, like sit, stay, come, heal, that sort of thing. If your dog does not walk beside you, if your dog pulls you on the leash, it may be an indicator that that dog cannot be a service dog. Now I will say that Gigi does not walk well with other people other than me, not even my partner. She will pull other people and part of her training was for her to guide me through different areas because I get very overwhelmed and overstimulated in public now. And so one of her tasks is get me out. I'll tell her to get me out and she will pull me to the nearest exit so that I don't have a panic attack in public. And <laughs> sometimes Gigi does not want to be walked by other people, which understandable, right? And still she is so good with me. She has never yanked on my leash. She's never hurt me. She's never tangled me up. She's never done any of that. If your dog does not listen to you, I don't think they can become a service animal. 
you need to be the pack leader. And if you are not that, then that dog will not respect you enough to, you know, listen and be trained. And I also think dogs that um, do not have empathy cannot become service dogs. And what I mean by that is if you are a dog owner, what I mean by that is if you are a dog owner and you walk your dog past another dog, if that dog barks at your dog and your dog starts barking back and starts pulling, I do believe that that dog lacks empathy. Or if your dog is the dog that barks at other dogs walking past, Gigi doesn't do that. And I think that's a huge marker of whether or not your dog can become a service dog. If it's easily excitable, I really think not. In the beginning of March 2011, only dogs are recognized as service animals under Titles 2 II and 3 of the ADA. Examples of such work or tasks include guiding people who are blind, alerting people who are deaf, pulling a wheelchair, alerting and protecting a person who is having a seizure, like what Gigi does, reminding a person with mental illness to take their prescribed medications, calming a person with post-traumatic stress disorder during an anxiety attack, or performing other duties. Service animals are working animals. They're not pets. The work or task that a dog has been trained to do must be directly related to the person's disability, and dogs whose sole function is to provide comfort or emotional support do not qualify as service animals under the ADA. Under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, an individual with a disability is entitled to a service dog to help them live their lives normally. The ADA protects disabilities. The ADA protects disabled individuals by allowing them to bring their service dog in most places where dogs are not permitted, including restaurants, hotels, housing complexes, and even air travel. Though technically any dog can become a service dog, the temperament of the dog is essential to how they can perform their duties. The best service dogs are smart and have temperaments that can make them easily trainable, make them serve well as reliable, calm under pressure, and not easily distractible. Breeds that have long histories of these traits and are purposely bred to maintain these qualities make the best service dogs. Service dogs must remain focused, attentive, and responsive to their owner's needs. The most popular service dogs are Labs and Golden Retrievers. Gigi is an English cream Golden Retriever. Did you pull your paw away? She doesn't like having her paws touched, which I've noticed about Gigi. And I think it's because one time I took her to a groomer and it's this one right here the groomer broke her nail and it was bleeding quite a lot and so Gigi has a little bit of trauma right there so she does yeah you don't like your paw being touched that's okay I'm sorry <clears throat> the most popular service dogs are labs and golden retrievers Gigi is an English cream golden retriever and she is the perfect size for me she can fit in between my legs when I'm sitting at an at a restaurant in an airplane. She is so good. And she she's so little. She's so little for a golden retriever. I think the English cream golden retrievers are really bred to be a smaller size. And from my own experience, those are preferable, especially if you are smaller in stature. Hi, baby. So service dogs are trained to help people with physical or mental disabilities and help them lead more independent lives. The best well-known service dog, when people think service dog, most of the time they think of a service dog for the blind or a guide dog. But 
service dogs can do so much more than just lead the blind. They can aid the hearing impaired. Mobility dogs can get items for their owners. They can, oh my gosh, have you seen that video of that dog being trained to do CPR and like jumping on the, like I think it's a mannequin, the mannequin's chest and listening and jumping. I'm gonna link the video down below. But service dogs are amazing. Dogs are so amazing, so very capable, so very smart. Like medical alert dogs, like Gigi, detect and warn their owners of an allergen. They warn their owners of an impending seizure or panic attack. They can detect the chemical changes within your body and alert you to something happening. That's mind blowing. You're really cool. She's like, I know. <laughs> so service dogs are any type of working dog. They're different from emotional support dogs or therapy dogs. So under the ADA, therapy dogs or dogs that come visit people in hospitals, at rehab facilitations. So therapy dogs, dogs that visit sick or ill people. So therapy dogs, you know, the types of dogs that visit the sick, the ill, the recovery. So under the ADA, only service dogs are allowed to go anywhere in public. And service dogs do not include ESAs or therapy dogs. So therapy dogs are amazing. I had one that visited me at a mental facility, but therapy dogs are just comfort dogs. Having a PTSD service dog can be life-saving. For veterans, their service dogs provide more than just emotional support especially for people dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder or a traumatic brain injury. Specialized service dogs not only perform specific tasks that help with these conditions, but recent studies show that they can reduce the amount of medication that these individuals use. Some veterans have stated that their service dog has alleviated so many symptoms outside of even their PTSD. According to my research, U.S. Senator Deborah Fisher has introduced a bill to fund service dog programs for veterans diagnosed with PTSD or a TBI. This bill can effectively give veterans a new lease on life. The Puppies Assisting Wounded Service Members Act of 2021, or the PAWS Bill, which is S951, sets up a grant program for service dog organizations that help people train dogs to assist veterans suffering from PTSD or a TBI. This bill and its companion bill, HR 1022, establish a three-year pilot program that is administered by the Department of Veteran Affairs, or the VA. Organizations and trainers accredited by the Assistance Dogs International, the ADI, or the International Guide Dog Federation, the IGDF, would receive the grants, which are $25,000 or less. Grants would be available for trainers and programs whose dogs meet the standards established by the Association of Service Dog Providers for Military Veterans, which requires the passing of several levels of the AKC Canine Good Citizen test, which Gigi has passed all of her tests. In addition to performing tasks that help m mitigate the veteran's specific disability, to qualify for a grant, organizations must also have staff available who understand the unique needs of the veteran with PTSD. There are many classifications of service dogs, but they usually fall under eight categories. Psychiatric service dogs, guide dogs, hearing dogs, seizure alert dogs, diabetic alert dogs, allergy detection dogs, mobility assistance dogs, and autism support dogs. So Gigi is certified as both a psychiatric support dog 
and a seizure alert dog. I will only be discussing these two during this episode because that's what I have experience with. A psychiatric service dog or a PSD is a type of assistance animal that is trained to perform specific tasks for individuals living with mental illness. These unique tasks are directly related to the handler's disability. Seizure alert dogs are trained to recognize the often elusive signs that their handlers are about to have a seizure. And from there, they both alert for help and position themselves in a way to protect the individual during the seizure itself. So Gigi, whenever she detects my seizures, which she usually, my doctor says, she detects them by smelling my cortisol levels rise. So cortisol is known as your stress hormone. It's more widely known as your stress hormone, but it does so much more, right? So your adrenal glands, which sit on top of your kidneys, will exert cortisol whenever you're in a fight or flight response. And for me, whenever I get into a fight, flight, fawn response, I have a seizure. And my doctor told me it's like when your PC is running and there's too much going on and everything is stalling, you have to restart your P your PC. So he said that's kind of what's happening in my brain is something's going wrong. And so my body just restarts itself, which sucks, but it happens. So before said seizure, Gigi alerts me that something is wrong by flipping my hand up several times and I try to get down on the ground. But if I cannot get down on the ground, she will grab my sleeve or grab the collar of my shirt right around here and try to pull me down. She'll jump up and try to pull me down to the ground. And if I'm having an active seizure, she will lay on top of me to try and prevent me from accidentally hurting myself. She has been really great. And honestly, I do believe that she has saved my life. I don't know what could have happened because I'm alone most of the time. Um, if I did not have Gigi and I had a seizure, who knows what could have happened. So I'm, I'm really grateful for Gigi. So cortisol is a steroid hormone that your adrenal glands, which are the endocrine glands on top of your kidneys, produce and release. Cortisol affects several aspects of your body and mainly helps regulate your body's response to stress. Your adrenal glands, also known as your supranatal glands, are small triangle, triangular shaped glands that are located on top of each of your kidneys and they're part of your endocrine system. Cortisol is an essential hormone that helps almost every organ. It affects almost every organ and tissue in your body, and it plays many important roles, including regulating your body's stress response, helping control your body's use of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, AKA your metabolism, suppressing inflammation, regulating blood sugar, and regulating blood pressure. And it also helps control your sleep awake cycles. So Gigi detects when I am too stressed. She tries to help me calm down. If that doesn't work, she alerts me of a seizure. If I have the seizure, she lays on top of me. And she's also been trained, though she hasn't had to do it more than twice is that if I'm having a seizure in public, she will go find help. Um, sorry. It's, on, it's only happened twice. Um, I'm really grateful to the people that um, found me. Um, and that's also why she has instructions on her service dog vest that says if the handler is down um do not call 911 unless it's really unless you ask unless it's really necessary because one time 
um, and you know, they, I don't know if I want to tell this story. I, I'm, maybe I'll tell the story another time. Um, I'm getting too worked up about it, but I digress. Gigi's great. <laughs> um, so when it's not obvious what a service animal provides to their handler, only limited questions are allowed. Staff at any establishment is only legally allowed to ask two questions. So question number one is, is the service dog required because of a disability? And then question number two is, what is the work or task that the service dog provides? No one can ask you for proof that your dog is a service dog. That is not legally allowed. Now, for an ESA, you do require a uh, letter from your doctor, but not for a service animal, because that is against the ADA to ask someone what their disability is. So special identification, such as a card, or um, a note that has their accreditation or their training papers such as that, uh, you don't need to carry that around. And if people ask for it, they shouldn't. Now, on that note, Gigi does have a printed license that I did pay for. It's not required, but I wanted it for my own security, like emotional security. Um, and she also, in my purse, I always carry her papers. The reason for this being is that sometimes ignorant people will harass me about her being a service dog. And it's usually uh, restaurant owners or restaurant staff. And they'll say, no dog, no dog. And um, I'll they'll ask for a card to see that she's a trained service dog. And so I keep it because I don't want to be hassled. And it's shitty every time they ask because legally they're not allowed to, but you know, I comply anyway. I don't know if I'm a part of the problem. I hope not, but I comply anyway because I, it's really stressful uh, to argue with them either way. And Gigi agrees. <laughs> Allergies and fears of dogs are not a valid reason for denying access or refusing service to people with service animals. When a person who is allergic to a dog or is allergic to dog dander, dog fur, and the person who uses a service animal must spend time in the same room or facility, they should be put on opposite ends of the room. But you can't be kicked out of an establishment because of your service dog. That is um, illegal, number one, discrimination, number two, and ridiculous on my, like in my own opinion, ridiculous. And thankfully I have not um, been kicked out because of my service dog, but the only reason why people can kick anyone out because of a dog is if that dog is number one not able to be controlled by their owner so if that dog is like out of control and the handler doesn't take a fact effective action to control the dog say if the dog is not on a leash and is running around the facility that's not a service dog number one but that is a reason that people could get kicked out for a service dog but in my own opinion, that is not a service dog. If your dog is not controlled, if your dog is not on a leash, if your dog uh, barks at people, if your dog pisses on the floor or shits on the floor, like say in a restaurant or a store, that's not a service dog, or at least that dog is not well-trained. So according to the ADA, 
if your dog is not housebroken, if your dog is not polite in public, and if your dog is not easily controlled or is causing some harm to someone else, that is not a service dog. ESAs provide support and companionship to their owners. They help ease anxiety, depression, and certain phobias. However, they're not service dogs. And an ESA user does not receive the same accommodations as a service dog user. ESAs are for people who need help, yes, but the difference between a service dog and an ESA is service dogs are required by people with disabilities. And so if you do not have a disability, you cannot have a service dog. ESAs are more of companionship and support and they have they require no specialized training while a service dog has to undergo at least four to six months of training. Gigi had six months of PTSD training and then a year of uh, seizure alert training, which I still train her every single day. A service dog's job lasts a lifetime and a service dog is trained to fulfill a role for the entire life of the owner. As long as the dog lives and protects and provides care for its owner, it is a service dog, no matter how old the dog gets. So to conclude this episode, if you see a service dog and you are in public, I think it's crucial that you remember it has a job to do and it should never be distracted, whether verbally or physically. Even if all you wanna do is say hello to the sweet dog, you gotta show restraint, right? Keep it in. And even if you do have remarks like, oh, pretty doggy or something like that, I would recommend that you keep those to yourself until at least the dog is out of earshot or eye sh or eyesight, you know? Because even statements like that, oh, there's a dog, can be distracting to the handler, which if the handler is looking someplace, sometimes the dog will often look that place as well and then get distracted. So, service dogs, are necessary to people with disabilities. And someone with a service dog may seem perfectly capable to you, but so many disabilities are invisible to the naked eye, such as seizures, such as having diabetes, such as, you know, having mental disabilities. Mm. Just because you think that person doesn't need a service dog doesn't make your judgment true and it doesn't make that person a liar you know use your best judgment when approaching any of these situations and please if you ever see me in public and you ever see me and Gigi I would love to meet you I would love to know you but I would implore you to not touch Gigi <laughs> hold back as much restraint as possible I know it's super hard and if you really desperately need to touch Gigi, please ask me first. Before petting any dog, you should always ask its owners first because you never know if that dog is friendly or not. So again, please stay safe out there. You know, make good choices. Use your best judgment. And if you see a service dog in public, Thank it for its service, but from afar. <laughs> Whenever we go out in public, we have to put on Gigi's vest. It's her service dog vest. This is Gigi's vest. I'm trying to prevent you from seeing her phone number on there. But this is what she wears anytime that we're out in public. And on the front, it says medical alert service dog.
which is what her classification is. Now, Gigi has had many vests before, but I think this is the best one that we've ever gotten for her. Gigi, come here. Can you turn around? That's the wrong way. Come on, move back. Sit. Okay, so it just easily goes on here. I slip her leg through. I buckle her on this side. Underneath, one, two, and then we're done. And she has her vest on and she's ready for duty. And her demeanor changes quite a lot. She becomes much more attentive towards me. Um, she starts to demonstrate that she's like, okay, I'm ready to work. I'm gonna follow you around. If I'm moving this way, she's gonna follow me. And even if we're in public, she will still follow me around, but part of her job is to lead me. And that confuses a lot of people <laughs> when I'm out in public. Um, they see her pulling, which she's not pulling. She's guiding me to a certain direction or trying to get me out of a crowd because, um, I'm pretty anxious in crowds, I would say. And uh, I think she notices that. And part of the way I trained her is that when we're in public, I don't wanna be in a crowded space. And so she'll do her best to try to get me out of a crowded space, which is pretty beneficial for me, at least. But yeah, she's really attentive. And then when we're in public, whenever I'm sitting down, she always has to sit down in between my legs like so, so that we don't take up too much space, number one, and also so that she's super close to me because that's her job. Her job is to be super close to me. So even if I get up, she's gonna get up. She's gonna follow me around. I'm gonna go this way. She turns with me and sit down again. She's gonna turn around and come back here in between and sit. And she's gonna sit down in between my legs. But yeah, there's so many service dogs. Service dogs have so many different jobs, right? Your service dog, if you have one, is trained for you. Whenever someone gets a service dog, they're trained especially for that person, for that certain task. And so, no service dog acts the same as another one. Gigi is a lot more sociable. She's a lot more friendly, and I would prefer it that way, especially with the place that we live in. It's um, very low income, and so I have noticed that a lot of children are afraid of dogs. And for good reason, there's a lot of not very well-trained dogs in this area but all of the kids in our neighborhood know that Gigi is safe, that Gigi will never bite them, that they can pet Gigi, they can pull on Gigi, they can do whatever they want with Gigi. She's not gonna do anything, right? And that's what I trained her to do, is just be super friendly. So even though she's supposed to alert me for when I have a seizure and stuff like that, she is still very accommodating towards other people. Now don't get it twisted. When I'm in public, she has something on her vest that says, do not pet service dog because you're not supposed to pet her. Now I'll be lenient on, especially um, families that if their kid runs up and pets the dog and they can't read, I'm not, I'm not gonna be mad, I'm just gonna be, hey, you gotta be careful because it's a service dog and you're not supposed to pet service dogs. And usually I want the parents to interject. And most often times parents do, the parents are like, hey, hey, watch out, look, the doggy has a sign, the doggy does a job. And that's great. But sometimes we're in public and um, there will be people that read her sign and still pet her. And that's really agitating because if 
they're petting her, they're getting her attention off of me and onto them. And um, that's kind of unacceptable. And that is preventing her from doing her job because she got a job. She's a smart lady. She's a college graduate. <laughs> she went to Texas Tech University with me. And so that's part of the reason why I have the do not pet on her vest. When we are at home, Gigi does not wear a collar. But whenever we go out in public, this is Gigi's collar. <laughs> she likes it very, very much. So it's Gigi on it. It has her service dog ID tag on there. And then we have an Apple Air tag because just for security reasons, on the off chance that, hey, someone nabs Gigi and runs away with her, you know, security. And some, it's, it's pretty dumb, I will admit, but it still helps me feel more secure, which is the whole point. Right, Loki? <laughs> and then there's her old service dog lead that we first got when she first became a service dog. Did he speak? <laughs> Good speak. <laughs> okay, lay down. Up. <laughs> Good job. Good job. <laughs> Remember, you are capable of a fulfilling life in spite of your circumstances and your trauma. May you rise again from the ashes and be filled with peace, love, hope, joy, and understanding. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.